Hi, everyone. I'm Bob McCarrick. I am the leader of the Middle Market Bank at Capital One Commercial Banking. And I'm happy today to be joined by two great panel participants. First, we have Amy Pollack. Amy works at LinkedIn. Uh, she's current, she is currently a sales leader. Her team partners with mid-market and enterprise organizations to help them attract, engage, and hire the best talent. She also has experience in helping organizations with diversity efforts, using data and insights to inform talent-related decisions and improving recruitment ROI. Welcome, welcome, Amy. It's great to have you here. Thank you. We also have Dan Shawbell. Dan is a New York Times bestselling author. He's a, a partner research director at Future Workplace and the founder of both Millennial Branding and WorkplaceTrends.com. He is the bestselling author of two career books, Promote Yourself and Me 2.0. And his third book, Back to Human, How Great Leaders Create Connection in the Age of Isolation, will be published by Hatchet on November 13th, 2018. So I encourage everyone here to check that out. Uh, he is also the host of a podcast called Five Questions with Dan Shawbell. So great. Welcome, Dan, as well. Happy to be here. So one thing we like to do at Capital One is we like to engage our client base. And our client base is largely comprised of middle market companies. And we define that as companies that start with about $100 million in revenue and up to about $3 billion. Uh, this is a huge part of the economy. They, rep about, they uh, represent about a third of the, G of, of the GDP, and they employ roughly 30 million people across the country. Last year, we did a study on disruption, technological disruption, and we had some really good marks on that. And we were thinking about what to do this year, and we focused on what we heard a lot of middle market executives talk about that concerns them, which is recruitment of talent and retention of talent. So we went out to 300 middle market CXOs and surveyed them, and we'd like to share some of those results with you today and get commentary from our panelists. Uh, one of the things that we heard is that retaining as well as recruiting talent is very hard today. And two of the primary reasons for that are, one, salary and compensation. It's tough to compete with large corporates. And the second being that um, there's really a lack of skilled applicants for the jobs that are available today. So I'd like to probe starting on both of those points and would like to start with you, Dan. What do you see companies doing to overcome the challenge of not being able to meet salary demands? Yeah, everyone from 16 years old to 65 year old, they want more money. Fair pay is so important. If they're not getting paid fairly, they don't care if you offer free pet care or paternal leave, none of that matters. So it, pay is really important to them. But once you get past pay, then flexibility is actually the most important, especially for young people, healthcare coverage, and then learning and development opportunities. And then as you get older, people want retirement programs, healthcare coverage becomes more important for obvious reasons, but you're not thinking about that when you're 24 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think that they have to appeal to all of that. And then I interviewed the former chief people officer at Google, and he said that the most important thing to employees was that they're working with really smart people. And so talent is so important, it will always be more important. But finding talent is a big challenge. There's now 6.9 million unfilled jobs in America, which is the highest it's been since I've looked at it in the past 10 years. And so companies are really struggling to find the talent, and they need to expand the talent pool and maybe find people that they would normally not recruit in order to fill that gap. And they, they could be people without a college degree. We mm -hmm. did a study with learning house of 600 employers, and over 90% are open to a uh, hiring people who don't have the four-year degree, and they might have those technical skills that are really important right now to help you solve your problems, fill the positions, and innovate. So pay is very important, right? Still continues to be the most important factor. Amy, as you think about compensation for employees and what you might see at your own company or mm -hmm. with clients and things that you speak to, um, how are they addressing the pay issue? Is it just straight salary and cash compensation? Are they offering more equity? What are some of the things that you're seeing middle market companies do? Yeah, I think it depends on the company. Obviously, like pay is always a hot topic, um, but there are other package elements that should come into play as candidates are considering whether or not to take an opportunity. It could be anything from flexibility, from different perks that the organization may offer, from equity. So there are a number of different ways that you, you look at the overall package, and I think it just depends on what's important to that individual as they evaluate whether or not it's something that they want to consider. Let's, uh, let's move on, move off of pay, and move to actual skill set. Mm -hmm. So a question for you, Amy. What advice or recommendations would you give companies that are having trouble finding the right skilled workers in the workplace? 
Yeah, well, I think specifically for mid-market companies, they're uniquely positioned because if you're a candidate and you're evaluating a different company to potentially make a move to, with a middle market company, you don't have the risk that you do with a startup, but you also don't necessarily have the red tape that comes along with moving to one of the larger enterprise organizations. So I'd say middle market is sort of the sweet spot. And then it's understanding as an employer what your unique selling proposition is, right? So every employer you know, has their, their story that they'd like to ideally tell the candidate pool, and it's ultimately how they're doing that. So at scale, you know, obviously there's a couple of different ways that they can. One is organically, whether it's through you know, telling their story via Facebook, via LinkedIn, via Twitter. Um, the other way, which oftentimes companies utilize, is, is actually putting a budget behind it. So sponsoring content to get to that specific talent pool to ultimately get within the consideration set to warm up these candidates to think about them as an employer of choice. Sure. So, um, and, and I'd say oftentimes companies do that when there, there's an immediate need, but ultimately it should, it should be an always on strategy. So that's sort of like the scaled approach, but then right. obviously right now, based on how competitive the marketplace is, there has to be that, that passive sourcing strategy as well. Most people who have the skills that organizations are looking for are happily employed. So again, you need to have that one-to-one -one outreach and reach out to those people who are already employed and not just consider applications that are coming in sure. through your website or other means where you may be, sure. be collecting resumes. Sure. Dan, one thing we, uh, we uh, spoke about in terms of skill set is that we tend to get into, when we're looking for skilled workers, pe folks who have college degrees. And are you seeing any trends where companies are now starting to look for skills for folks that may not have a college degree? Yeah. Or straight out of high school? The biggest professional service firms in the world are looking past the college degree in order to expand their talent pool, not because they think it's a good idea right now, but they think that it's a necessity. Because if you don't widen the pool, you're never gonna find the right people in order to fill that gap because you're also competing with so many other companies, sure. both big and small. And I do agree that the mid-market isn't a great opportunity because a lot of young people don't wanna work for the biggest companies in the world because they're seen as old and archaic and not in high growth, uh, high growth situation. Mm -hmm. So they wanna work for a bit smaller of a company. There was a Deloitte study that actually came out that found that uh, young people want job security now because a lot of them have been underemployed, have suffered through the economy, so they are looking for some sort of security. Um, but they want to learn, they want to develop themselves, and companies need to invest in training and development. And what we found is per each individual employee, they're only investing $500. And I don't think that's enough that's to create enough. a culture yeah. of learning to be able to fill their sure. internal gap because talent has to come in two ways, right? It has to come internally and it has to come externally. So what she was referring to is passive job seekers, right? People who already have a job but are open to new opportunities. And so companies have to be able to take that talent. You can do it through LinkedIn, you can do it through many other means, but then they also have to look to the active candidate that might not be in touch with many employers because they're overlooked. Mm -hmm. So it's the cross between active and passive. Passive, you know, the research shows that they have a higher likelihood of being successful in the job, right? And then they have to think about taking their current employees and retraining them for the, the skills that are going to become more valuable. Like at and is investing over a billion dollars into retraining their current workforce, and they were transparent with the workforce saying, hey, your job is not gonna exist in the, in the next decade because we're moving into new markets, and we're going to support you as you transition to these new roles. And if you don't wanna make this transition with us, if you don't want to upscale, sure. then you're gonna probably have to look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's a that, that's really bold move for a large corporation to make. I, I actually had it for the first time in my career when I had a, um, I had a round table with a bunch of Capital One associates and a newly hired employee said that they were concerned about in 10 years that their job might be disintermediated by artificial learning. And so have you seen trends, either of you, in that? Is that something that you're hearing from candidates that are out there that they're concerned about going into professions that technology could have a major impact on? Yeah, yeah, they're absolutely concerned. There's so many conflicting reports though. Yeah, I've reviewed over 8,000 studies in the past 10 plus years, and even all these new, there's two studies out this week that showed that there's gonna be net, a net mm -hmm. neutral economic impact with sure. artificial intelligence, and then there's one where there's gonna be more jobs lost and gained and, and fewer jobs uh, lost. And so it's, it's hard to know what's gonna happen. The one thing that's for sure 
is there's going to be incremental change. You're not right. going to wake up tomorrow and a robot is going to serve you breakfast. Right. Right. But I wish but, that would but, happen, but it's but not going to happen. At coffee sure. shops now, there is a robot that makes right. coffee for you. So we're we're going in that direction, which means if you're a barista, you might want to think about how to reinvent your job because it's going to change in the future. Sure. Right. If you drive Uber, you know, eventually Uber's going to have all driverless cars, so you've got to prepare for that. So we know these changes are going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight, but that should empower the individual to make these changes so that they prepare for the future. And companies should be very transparent and, with and really workforce, with their workforce and say, hey, we're going to go through these changes like AT&T did. You're going to have to make changes, and we're going to support you or direct you to a place that mm -hmm. can re-educate you into the jobs that we're going to be looking for because it ends up saving them so much money if they help their current workforce. Absolutely. Yep. It's true. Uh, let's talk about digital and social tools. This is a question for Amy. So our yeah. study found that just over half of mid-market companies already have a, solo, a social media recruiting strategy, but that means that almost half did not. Yeah. So of course, the use of LinkedIn has become more widespread in recent years. Can you talk a bit how, how you advise companies on digital recruiting strategies? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, digital recruiting has absolutely changed the landscape for, for all companies, not just mid-market companies. And what it's done is it's really democratized um, recruiting today. So whereas larger organizations potentially may have had an advantage, uh, you know, historically, now all organizations pretty much have access to the same exact talent pools. So I think the big thing with that is what organizations are able to actually do with that information and those different tools because obviously it doesn't work if you're not using it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that, that's one piece, just ensuring that organizations are using the appropriate tools. And then the second piece is that now more than ever, organizations have the opportunity to tell their story. So whether that's on LinkedIn, whether that's on their own digital career site, the number one thing that candidates want to know before making a move to a different organization is what it's like to work at that company. So, so what does that mean? Does that mean em sure. employee testimonials? Does that mean the company's own sort of verbatim about what they think it's like? Yeah, I, I'd say in an ideal world, employee testimonials, like non, um, non-canned like company right. photos, you know, like an authentic sure. look at what it's like to work there. Um, usually that's what resonates best and where we see the most engagement on LinkedIn because mm -hmm. it's pretty transparent to a candidate if there is stock photography used, right? Right. So um, making sure that companies are actually taking advantage of that. I know some of my customers, they, they have a hashtag where anything that they do that's related to company culture will will tag it so that as candidates are evaluating whether or not they want to make a move, there's an easy way for them to understand what a day in the life looks like, what the culture is like. So I think between the tools that all of these organizations now have access to, and, and it's really leveled the playing field, and now the opportunity to really promote what a day in the life is like, um, it, it provides both companies and candidates with an advantage that they didn't have historically before there was so much focus on, on digital sure. within their recruitment. And there's a really important part to what yeah. she's saying is really what the technology has done, it's lowered and closed the experience gap from not working for the company to working at the company. So if you know what you're in for, you can make a better decision as an individual. True. And by putting yourself and your stories out there about who you are as a company and the people you work with, you are saying, hey, if this is not what you want, don't apply here, which saves everyone time. So it, it helps with matchmaking right. yeah. because you're providing more information. But a lot of companies fear doing it because you have to be transparent. You know, you, using just stock photography doesn't, is not real. People, the reason why people even watch reality TV is because at least it seems real. Mm -hmm. And so if a company can I really- I thought it was real, man. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. a company can really like put themselves out there and say, hey, this is the cubicle you're probably gonna work at if you accept this job, and the individual is like, that's not for me, then it's not for them. And, they'll go, and then the next person who applies, maybe it's a better match, and then they accept the job, and they'll stay with them longer. So the best recruiting strategies impact retention. So it's really trying to be as truthful and honest, allowing your associates to post and do candid posting so that whoever is looking at the company gets the real sense of what they're in for. Yeah, and right. the other thing that we studied is candidate experience. So if you give a candidate a horrible experience, and the number one thing that they're looking for is to know where they are in the recruiting process, and if you don't signal that, if you don't say, hey, you're on your second interview or you didn't get the job, they'll never apply for your job throughout the rest, uh, a job at your company again for the rest of their career. And if you are Pepsi, let's say, they'll, stop, they'll start shopping at Coke. Sure, sure. That's, uh, that's really informative. 
It also sounds like, though, based on what you said, Amy, that mm -hmm. if you don't have a social media platform, if you aren't having any digital outreach yeah. to potential candidates, you need to get one. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, what about the importance of mobile? So our study found that almost two thirds of mid-sized companies are focusing on building mobile recruiting strategies. What should companies be most cognizant of when it comes to recruiting on mobile? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to see that number be at 100%. If you think just about how you engage as you know, an individual on a daily basis, mobile is probably the number one thing sure. that, that people are engaging with, right? Mm -hmm. So I like to tell my customers to start there. So have a mobile first strategy and then work backwards. So that's a really, really critical component, um, whether it is how you're communicating with your potential follower base, whether it's your own career site, you want to make sure that when a candidate gets there, it's mobile optimized. If not, just again, like think about it from your own perspective. If you are sitting there on your phone, like opening and, and trying to zoom in, like you, you'll, you'll probably, you know, yeah. switch gears pretty quickly. So that coupled with ensuring that your application process is also mobile friendly and that it's very easy for candidates to complete the process on their mobile phone it is critical just based on how, you know, how complicated normally the process is to get someone to even consider you as an employer if they're already at the application process and then you lose them there, that's a huge miss. Right. What's crazy is only a fourth of career sites are mobile friendly, yet job seekers spend at least four hours per week searching on their mobile phone. So if you are a middle market company, yep. you either have a digital strategy or you don't, make sure you start with mobile. Mobile yep. first, right. eventually it'll be right. watch first, eventually it'll be like contact lenses yeah. first. Then it'll be virtual it's about reality. Convenience. It's the right. convenience of the customer, it's yeah. the convenience of, of the job seeker too. It's all about conven what's convenient for them. How about virtual reality? You could spend a virtual day in the office and decide whether you <laughs> right. want to take the that, job. That's right? actually that's what's, what's happening. Next. It's happening with the Army now. GE has virtual reality headsets if you go to career fairs. Wow. So they want to do that. They want to close the gap and, and let people know what they're in what for. They're actually because in it's for. good for everyone. Yeah. Are there, um, when you talk about digital strategies though, I'm curious, are there certain age brackets that you're really targeting with that? Or is it span anyone from, you know, in their 60s all the way down to right out of school? These days, it's, it's it pretty much spans, everybody. Yeah, I mean, and I don't want to only speak about LinkedIn, but I can speak about our traffic. About 70% of our traffic comes from mobile, just to put it into perspective. Okay. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, let's move on to retention. So. Recruiting is obviously a major focus, but once you recruit someone, you obviously want to retain them, and there's a lot of costs, obviously, as we know, to losing employees that you've trained and that have been at your company and that have absorbed the culture, so on and so forth. Um, how do you motivate employees to stick around? What, what are some of the better strategies that you guys have seen in the market? Yeah, work is about what you do and who you do it with. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit less about the brand you work for or, or the location because your experience on a daily basis is with those people doing that work. And so if you don't get along with the people you work with, if your personalities don't gel, and if they don't challenge you, because everyone wants to be challenged and to grow in their careers, uh, you're just not gonna stay with the company. And it's gonna co it cost 1.7 times as much to hire externally as it does internally. Mm -hmm. And the cost for replacing a candidate, if they're or a worker, is at least 20,000 up until over 100,000, depending on their level. So it, it's very costly, and then it takes months to replace someone. So it's better to get the right person at the job at the right time, and then engage them by providing them learning and development opportunities, a fair wage, and then mentoring, flexible hours, a lot of recognition. People don't want to wait a year for an annual performance review. People want instant gratification. Right. You gotta mm -hmm. constantly tell them day in, day out what they're doing right and maybe what they could improve on. Because any you wanna create as many touch points as possible, mm -hmm. right? Especially in a world where a third of, of the workforce works remote, we're, we're starting to lose that human contact, right. right? Because everything's becoming decentralized. What's good is people get, people get the freedom and flexibility to work when, where, and how they want, but then it's limited those social interactions that are so important to not just work and productivity, but our livelihoods. Sure. And so I think it's important on the leader in the organization to use video conferencing, to do offsites and social events to make sure that people feel like they belong to the organization right. and that they're part of something that's bigger than them. Um, when I first started in the workforce, Amy, uh, we wore suits five days a week. 
Yeah. Uh, I didn't see Pretty clients, too, but yeah. I still wore a suit. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, over time we went to casual Fridays and then it went to completely casual and then remote working and flexible work schedules. Uh, can you talk about some of the other things you mentioned it early on about? It's not just about incentive comp that gets them in the yeah. door, but then to retain them. Can you talk about some of the other things that companies should do in order to make sure that they are and, and, and even if it's not in their culture, yeah. how important it is for them to change their culture to adapt to what's happening in the marketplace? Yeah, I, so I think there's, there's two points there. Just to add to what Dan was saying, one of the other things that I see organizations doing is surveying their internal employees to understand, are they happy? Where are the areas of improvement? And then ultimately, obviously, if you're asking those questions, you have to then act on the results and making sure that it's not falling on deaf ears. Sure. So I think, I don't necessarily think there's a one size fits all strategy. I think the best companies potentially are um, taking a look at, maybe you can't do it down to the individual le level, but you can make changes based on function. So are there specific functions where maybe there's the ability to provide more flexibility? Mm -hmm. Are there some functions where if you're not client facing, maybe you can like ease up on the dress code? Um, you know, obviously things that could span the realm of all of your employees include things like stock options, different perks and benefits, but I do think that there are other things outside of that that you could customize based on what, what the needs are of your employees and what the feedback is. The, um, it was interesting in the study that I think it was only 31% of employers allowed a flexible work schedule. Mm -hmm. And that just seems like in today's wow. day and age right. with how in touch we are constantly in mobile technology, that only 31% doing that. It's you know, a huge there's a, opportunity. There's a million new millennial moms per year. Really? Yeah, I interviewed 100 people for the book yeah. and 15% had a kid in the past six months. Wow. So it's happening and companies have to support it. And support. it's human life cycle, right? It's like at this stage, you're gonna have, have the next big baby boom. And if companies are not willing to give flexible work schedules, remote work, uh, job sharing, capabilities and programs, people are gonna leave right. because people need it. Right. And so it's interesting because based on what you're saying, it's like you need mass customization, right? You have to create programs and philosophies and values that support a whole corporate culture. But at the same time, the manager has to meet with each individual and understand their needs at that moment. Absolutely. And those needs could change in five years. Mm -hmm. And then when you think about incentive comp, I would assume if you need a flexible work schedule and your current employer isn't willing to do it, incentive comp becomes a little bit of a secondary consideration, assuming that you can find someone who will allow you to have that flexible work schedule. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about social media. How does that play a role in employee retention? plays a big role because I think every employee is a brand evangelist, whether they sign up for it or not. You represent the brand. So if you're misbehaving online on Instagram or Absolutely. Twitter or Facebook, that's going to hurt your company, not just yourself. Even it's if, why if I'm it's drinking out of a Capital One coffee mug, <laughs> yeah. just so people can see. Sorry. Yeah. So I think that's really important. And I think that people want to be connected with those that they work with, not just in the physically in person or on the phone but online too. We have the natural need to connect. And I think that's one of the greatest things that the internet's done for us is it's given us all of these platforms by which we can connect for better or worse. Mm -hmm. but, but people have the, that inherent need. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. After safety and security and food and shelter, it's love and friendship. Right. And so right. in the workplace, we lack those. Right. And I think people, some are introverts, some are extroverts, but people want to connect regardless of who you are and where you are. Yeah, and I think just the, the only thing to add to that is when companies, you know, try to really enable their employees to act as advocates, they see results not only on the retention side, but also on the recruitment side. Because mm -hmm. when you're posting to your own network and people see that you're happy in your job and you're posting about what a great experience you've had, you're more likely to have people reach out to you and say like, hey, you know, is there an opportunity open for me? Right. So, you know, obviously that cuts down on recruiting costs as well and ultimately has longer term benefits. It's actually salesforce.com. I, I used to, in my presentations, I had them as a case study because they told all their, all their Salesforce people, their actual sales teams to promote uh, open sales positions on LinkedIn. And they got like a million impressions. They filled up their whole talent pool because people are friends with people who are like them. Right. So if you've ha you have all these great salespeople working for you, they're probably friends with people with a similar DNA sure. or personality who are going to fit in very well. And so it's, it actually it can be a great That's a really strategy. interesting tool and something that folks should think about, you know, yeah. engaging your employee base to then be the advocate for you, yeah. right? 
and there's no cost, right? So it's like, right. there, it's basically just providing that communication to your employees. And it does also come from the top. So as leaders, you want to make sure that your leadership team is doing it so that their direct reports are doing it and it trickles down from, from there as well. Uh, another thing cited in, this, in the study in terms of recruitment challenges where 30% of middle market executives said that career positioning and career development and the inability to tell someone that in five years you will be in this role, that it's a real challenge with the workforce today. Do you see anything that folks are doing to try to bridge that gap or to try to allow folks to be a little bit more patient? Yeah, I think one of the things is having a, a learning and development strategy. So even if the exact position isn't open within a certain time frame of whatever you know that employee's expectation is, they feel like they're still learning and growing in their current role. Um, so just ensuring that that communication is open and that there is a plan in place, because ultimately, if, if there isn't that open communication and a plan, then then that employee likely will feel like sure. they're in a dead end. That's 100% right. And I, I like what Intel does. They have the development opportunity tool, DOT. Okay. And so it's an internal short-term job posting uh, website where if you work for the company, and let's say you're in accounting or you're in engineering, and you're but you're really curious about what it's like to work in the marketing department or PR, mm -hmm. You can look at this internal board, and let's say PR, they're working on you know, a big media campaign. You, you'll see that posting for six weeks, two months, and you can apply for it. And if you get it, then you do that work on top of your full-time job, but that can ease you into transitioning to that group potentially in the future because you'll already have the contacts and the experience. So it's allowing the fluid workforce to happen because you have all these people mid-market, large company, even small company, you have the people move them around because they might not be in a position to be successful in their current job, but their skill set might make sense in a different department. It, it, it's a good point. There's a couple things we do in my business as well to encourage sort of career development. One is we do a lot of mentorships. So senior people mentoring on a regular basis, folks who, are, uh, who have a desire to sort of learn more. Um, we've got a chief learning officer that we hired recently who also is looking to put together programs. Yeah for folks to learn and develop and improve their skills. And then we just get together. It's, it's something we're going to do new this year. Uh, my entire senior leadership team and their managers will get together to talk about top talent and folks that are looking to make that next leap mm -hmm. and whether or not they're someone who could be considered for the various open positions that are within the business. I find that a lot of it is just about communication. It's, it's folks being knowledgeable that, hey, there's somebody in New York City or there's somebody in Dallas, Texas. Who, who, who is a top talent and is looking for a job. I don't have one in my business, but there might be another business where there is an opportunity. And that, a lot of that has to do with ego, too. Like, a, a lot of managers are selfish, and they're like, we don't want to lose we this employee lose because this we're, gonna have to, sure. uh, we're gonna have to replace them. It's gonna take a long time. And so we have to train managers and leaders to take a step back and say, hey, this is good for the company. It's good for you if you let talent move because they're gonna leave anyways. And it's better they move within your organization and than leave. outside, absolutely, 100%. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, published in March 2018, first time ever, that the number of open positions um, was equal to the number of unemployed. So that's the first time ever since they've been recording these. I'm interested in your comments around this. It seems as if um, it could be driven by a few factors, right? Could, there could be a geographic difference, right? Everybody in Florida needs to hire folks, and the population is all in the Northeast. Or it could be driven by skill set. Um, I'm curious as to your thoughts around that. It clearly has an impact across the labor market, but maybe more in particular to middle market companies is they battle large corporates around incentive comp, which we know is one of the most important criteria. So do you have any thoughts around those stats? I think it's partially the school system's fault, and I think it's partially individual's fault, okay. and I think it's partially employer's fault. You know, I think everyone wins when they all work together. I think the individual has to have some sort of drive and ambition to learn the new skills and can't just remain stagnant in their career. Otherwise, they'll miss up on opportunities and their job might not exist in five years. The average relevancy of the skills is only five years. So it's risky to just not upscale yourself. Sure. I think at the company and the school system, only 40% of companies are helping colleges that they recruit on actually 
develop their curriculum to make it more relevant to the current marketplace. So I think colleges and companies need to get closer together to make sure that curriculum is going to help produce the students with the right background and skills that will be more employable and fill the skills gap of the companies that they serve. These schools serve companies. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a company like Google recruits at only maybe 16 schools. So those schools need to serve Google because the schools remain in business because uh, they have uh, placement rates. But Google also needs to get back to the school. But Google right. needs to get back to the school. So you're seeing a lot more uh, companies come into schools and teach classes to yeah. fill the gap and help it. But I don't think that's the end all be all. I think you know, at the, even the president level in these schools, they have to get together with the CEOs of this company, the company or the heads of HR and really go over where the skills gaps are and then HR needs to update job descriptions. HR needs to start to target people with those skills. But you can, if you don't have the talent pool with those skills, or if you're unwilling to uh, recruit people with untraditional backgrounds, this skills gap's never going to be filled. And we, it's proven yeah. over the years. We have 6.9 million unfilled jobs in America, right? So it, it keeps getting wider. So no one's correcting this problem. And it's something that I've been seeing and studying for so many years. And I think it's getting the right people on the table and taking it very seriously. And even if you have to you know, steal talent from companies uh, to be able to teach the right classes to prepare people, I think you, you just need to do it. And it has to happen at a young age. Mm -hmm. People, high, half of high school students now have an internship. When you're younger, because we have access to so much information, you're privy to you know, what type of career decisions you want to make. And so companies, like there are companies that are coming in like a Deloitte when people are in middle school and saying, hey, this is what it's like to work in an accounting firm. So when you're graduating college, eventually you might think of Deloitte when you're graduating. So from a branding and marketing position, I think companies have to come in earlier as well. So do you see a potential propensity for corporations, middle market companies as well, to even engage more on the partnership aspect with colleges and universities and fund individual uh, students that are going after a skill set that's going to meet their needs? I think this is where it's going. Yeah. That's really interesting. So being in the educational space, making sure you're aligning with the right universities, partnering yeah. with the right I mean, there folks. There was a Wall Street Journal article that just came out. Solutions. Companies are so fed up with colleges now that they're becoming their own colleges. Mm -hmm. That's There's always been corporate universities. There's sure. you know, Deloitte University. There's GE Crotonville mm -hmm. well, in uh, upstate New York. And so now companies are like, well, we need people. We're desperate. T uh, about 24% of them want to use artificial intelligence to close their skills gap, we've just mm -hmm. found. But in general, I think that they're, they're taking that leadership position. And I don't think them doing it fully in-house is the full solution. I think they need to work closer with schools because the schools already have the systems in place and the students. That's a really good point. Um, let's talk a little bit about the younger generation, the millennial generation. Um, it seems as if expectations of what they want tend to differ somewhat. And maybe you could talk a little bit about differing expectations of millennials, what, what corporations are doing in order to address that. And particularly for the middle market executives we might have listening to this, uh, just a deeper understanding. Yeah. I mean, I think most millennials at this point, they, they expect some of the, the perks and benefits that I feel like probably 10 years ago were more of the exception. Um, so, you know, everything like having, you know, maybe it's lunch once a week, maybe it's some type of cafe, maybe it is the flexibility that, you know, it, it normally would take historically someone years to build up that equity to be able to ask for it. Sure. That's the expectation now coming into you know, their, their first and second jobs. So companies just need to be aware that that's more of, I'd, I'd say, the norm now than, than it's ever been, just to be competitive in the marketplace. And, and, and you talked about feedback, right, and more continual feedback. And I've found, at least with our younger associates, that they really crave for that. Yeah, you have to give praise first and then criticism second. So you have to say, hey, I, your presentation was great. I, you know, I thought that some of the ideas that you presented were really effective for this group but you might have to check your tone next time because I think you turn some people off in the meeting. That's how you give feedback. That's how you get feedback. And this is, it's continuous too because sure. people are very impatient now. No one wants to wait a year for any performance review. Adobe and GE, they have continuous performance reviews now. It's always happening every day, the check-in system. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think giving recognition should be part of the culture. You know, If you see someone doing a nice deed for another employee, you should comment on that because then other people will see it and then they'll do the same. Um, last thing I want to touch on is culture. 
And that's obviously critically important. We've talked about trying to get folks before they join your company to be exposed to the culture uh, through social media and those types of tools. But I'm wondering if you should do anything managerially to engage younger associates in strategy, in innovation, get them involved more at levels that perhaps in the past folks would not have been involved in to give them more ownership. Yeah, I'd say that's what could set an employer apart. As, as candidates are considering different opportunities, the ability to make an impact normally is, is very high on the list. So providing them the opportunity to get exposure to things that potentially they wouldn't have exposure to, that's really, you know, the manager sets the stage for that. And that should be top of mind for, for organizations in order to attract and, re- and maintain um, and retain the, the appropriate talent. Right. Yeah, and you said that Capital One does that. In my opinion, mentoring or learning and development doesn't happen in isolation. No, you know, it's about bringing people together who can learn from each other. So I think people who are older and are more veterans in the company can learn from young people, and young people can learn from people who are veterans, mm-hmm. right? So I think we can come together because we all can take something and learn lessons from each other. Um, maybe young people are more savvy with technology, and people who are, have been in a company for a long time could un- better understand the technology sure. to stay relevant in their job. Because ageism happens on both sides. Age- ageism happens when you're young. When I was writing career advice articles at 22, you know, I got bullied online. And then, you know, I'm sure ageism is going to happen when I'm 65, 70. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's hard to find a job when you're 65, 70. And you know, it can be frustrating when you're younger because people think you don't know enough and maybe you do have a lot to learn. And so I think we can bridge the generational gap and any diversity gap by understanding that we're all human and that we can all learn from each other. Sure. Last question, are there any beacons out there of companies that you would suggest folks focus on that are doing all of this around recruitment and retention exceptionally well? Besides LinkedIn. Besides LinkedIn, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are a couple of companies, like Delta comes to mind. They do a really nice job with developing their culture, having it highlighted on social media. But I think that the key thing with you know, evaluating how well companies are doing is it's not a one-size-fits-all strategy. So it depends on you know, where the challenges are, how to be nimble, how to have a strategy that, that is always on. Um, but it, it differs by function, it differs to what's important to each talent pool, and you really need to make sure that you are um, customizing your approach based on what each individual function or talent pool is looking for. That's right. I would say Netflix for three reasons. One is because they're extremely competitive on pay, on purpose, mm-hmm. because they know you're gonna look elsewhere, and then you'll realize how lucky you are. Sure. Number two is they publish a culture deck online, so they are saying this is who we are, and this is who we're not, like it or not. And so that attracts the right people and repels the wrong people. And if you get the right people, they'll potentially stay longer. Um, And then three is they have unlimited maternal paternal leave, which is extremely good for the millennial generation. New millennial moms. Absolutely. Yeah. And and no one else has that. I mean, Facebook and all some of these technology companies give you multiple weeks, but unlimited. And so I think that's important because, again, if you're serving the needs of your employees, they'll be more than happy to do their best for you and stay with you longer. And you probably get free Netflix as well, which is <laughs> yes. just another perk, right? So great. Well, I want to thank Amy, and I want to thank Dan. I thought this has been a great session. Uh, look for Amy out on LinkedIn. Look for Dan's new book coming out in November. And I hope everyone's enjoyed this. Thank you.